morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to kind of usher you into the weekend. It is uh, September 10th. We're one day away from the 20th uh, memorial anniversary of 9-11, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the news today. So kicking off with your news thing, one of the biggest things that happened overnight is uh, Biden's uh, mandate on uh, vaccinations in for federal employees. So Biden has uh, made a major step towards a mandate forward for all federal employees to get the vaccine. Part of this goes into the current administration's goal to curb the variants that are mutated among the unvaccinated groups. This mandate will be the first step towards forcing unvaccinated people to getting the vaccine. This will affect 80 million Americans and the Department of Labor's uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, is developing a rule requiring all employees with at least 100 employees to make sure that their workforce is fully vaccinated. Uh, OSHA will also fine employers $14,000 if they don't comply. Otherwise, most federal jobs will have to uh, provide regular testing for unvaccinated federal workers. The criteria on this mandate is pretty clear, but overall does not have any teeth in a lot of the private sectors. So that's what OSHA is working on currently. And so far, the Republican Party on the other side is looking to do a lawsuit against the Biden administration, considering this is unconstitutional to force people into doing vaccines. There's a lot of weird laws and mandates going around as well. Uh, Texas is also still on the uh, on the block for lawsuits in terms of their abortion uh, ruling that they made just recently. Um, the part of it, just a little bit of background, is that uh, th one of the most restrictive abortion laws in uh, our entire nation and it can be up to six weeks uh, for uh, for th those abortions to be ineligible because that's usually when the heartbeat is detected. So, And also another uh, news as well is that the Florida mask ban mandates along with the anti-riot law in Florida. So the, uh, there's a new law in Florida that's coming out of the woodworks and it is a anti-riot law, uh, which seems to have many loopholes on what can be determined as a riot. Uh, they got a drum circle going, they're beating, they're beating the drum, that's a riot. But joking aside, uh, Riots have always been dealt with by force regardless, but this probably goes into more protections to those stopping the riots than anything else. There's a lot of big issues to start this in this morning, but let's take a look back in time and a little bit of the future. So Afghanistan, we have officially Enter, entered the unknown world of what's happening, what's going to happen next in Afghanistan. Uh, things are in a constant state of what if, um, and Taliban is trying to spread sh uh, Sharia law, which ha was always their goal. Um, it's basically just a, a combination of law and re their religion, boom, putting it together. And so far, uh, the pockets of resistance and a few uh, are few, and Taliban have claimed total victory in the uh, region of Afghanistan. Uh, and so far, it's not. Uh, not about what they are doing, but they, what they have to do for their 30 plus million people uh, dealing with a country that has been cut off by the rest of the world. And in many ways, the U.S. was their, uh, uh, their money line, their lifeline for the longest time. And since the U.S. left, uh, everything seems fine, but a lot of news sources say that many people have to deal with the shortages in food and supplies. Money seems to be becoming more and more worthless in the region. Uncertainty is surrounding this country and will continue uh, one day away from the 20th uh, memorial of 9-11. So 9-11 did a lot of things, uh, changed everybody's life. It was a big chunk of my life. Over m half my life now has been something to do with the uh, Afghan conflict. Um, and 9-11 changed the way we think about the world and how uh, just a small group of people can plan and execute a something that would force America to change how we think about wars moving forward. There's a lot of times there's no full frontal wars that we were used to back in World War II. Uh, there's just all, all sorts of changes and stuff like that. But I, I just also wanted to uh, reassure you guys as well is that it wasn't the Taliban that uh, did the operation. It was Al-Qaeda. So Al-Qaeda is the group responsible for the attack, forced Americans to uh, get involved in the Middle East. And in the 20-year war that most people's assurances have ended, Al-Qaeda is not central to Afghanistan as they are a group that would live nomadically. They're in Afghanistan, Pakistan, many different regions of that area. But uh, Afghanistan had was known at that time as being a stronghold for a lot of uh, uh, terrorist organizations and refugees and stuff like that. So many things came out of the war and occupation. Uh, innovations with technology, Skype videos. You're now able to talk to someone in real time across the world with your phone, something that was very unheard of at that time. Military tactics became uh, began to change as well with more of a remote, small ops kind of deal. Um, difficult times persisted as more and more misinformation was being fed to us, resulting in our war with Iraq and uh, the escalating conflict with Iran. With uh, most of us grew up with this war, a modern day Vietnam that ended 
was pretty much forgotten in the minds of Americans after uh, 2011 when uh, Osama bin Laden was assassinated by the U.S. government. In many respects, uh, that was the end of the war, but um, it was too easy to connect these groups with the Taliban for who all intents and purposes only wanted to uh, control Afghanistan and not a create what Al-Qaeda ISIS wanted, which was power and installing an empire throughout the Middle East. Uh, Taliban are not uh, the good guys to any degree, but they have something uh, that they never knew they would have, Afghanistan. And, and, and how the nation bill is still in progress. So that's just something that's moving forward. And um, speaking of progress, uh, Missoula has... Uh, their election coming up. This is the primary election, so it's due by uh, pretty much next week. And so Missoula has mailed out ballots for uh, Missoula's upcoming election season, which include your ward reps and uh, mayor of Missoula, which I will not talk about politics, So, but I will say that there are many locations you guys can find and drop off your uh, ballots as well. So I'm going to show you uh, a map of the uh, kind of like the election center. There's also another area near the uh, Missoula uh, fairgrounds, but this is the one that's off of Russell Street. So if you take a look right here, you get uh, election center, which is right there just off of Wyoming Street. This is uh, the intersection of Wyoming and Russell Street across from, uh, let's see, Home Resource. And so there's, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, in, you know, like there's a drop off place, you can go in person, all that kind of stuff as well as we are doing our primary here in the city of Missoula. They also have plenty of drop off fins around the sites, the including the Missoula County Courthouse downtown near the transit center. It looks like the courthouse type building, you can't miss it. Uh, <laughs> some bad news on our sports front as well as we move on. Um, uh, a lot of uh, COVID uh, scares are going on here in the city of Missoula, so uh, MCPS is. Uh, and also the uh, Hellgate Athletic Director, Nick Lausch, uh, said uh, further games like Sever September 17th football games are still listed as is. And but so far, all games until September 13th are suspended and will look into getting rescheduled in the future. MCAT will also be covering a good chunk of these games for the fall season until the end of October before the uh, playoff season start. So I, up, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about that. We uh, covered the volleyball game between um, yeah, CMR and Sentinel, which uh, the game before we covered uh, between the football game between the boys Hellgate and the boys uh, CMR, which is uh, out of uh, Great Falls. So anyways, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I have a very special interview with Soft Landing Executive Director Mary Poole, and Afghanistan is on a lot of people's minds, and uh, some of the families from Afghanistan, some of the refugees actually came to Missoula, uh, and um, I asked Mary Poole a little bit more about this, and this is what she had to say. So uh, when I come back, I'll have some pre-critic. Hey guys, welcome back. We're here with Mary Poole, and she's here uh, from uh, Soft Landing. You are the executive director of Soft Landing. Yes. And uh, I believe you guys have been working this since like 2016, I believe? Yeah. About around 2016, so yeah. Yeah, I remember when you guys first came in, you were talking about uh, kind of restarting a refugee kind of program to have people come into the city of Missoula. Because Missoula uh, has a, had a long history of working with the Hmong population from like 75 until the 90s. Because I did a little bit of research before yeah. and I used to look into it. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of crazy just like the way things are happening right now. And not to mention, you have a, a couple of events that are happening this weekend as well. Do you want to talk a, a little bit more about those? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, right now is a really busy time for refugees in the world. Um, and Missoula welcomes refugees from a lot of different places. Primarily, right now, families are coming from Congo and Africa, um, Iraq and Syria, um, as well as a handful of families from Eritrea. Um, we are having some Afghan families come to Missoula. Um, those families right now are, are kind of passing through Missoula to, to arrive at a connection um, with someone who um, they previously knew. But, you know, it is a path that may be continued to be open um, as the situation in Afghanistan unfolds over years, really. Yeah. Um, so we're preparing for that. Um, but, you know, a lot of the other work that Soft Landing also does is um, to get the word out about um, refugees in our community yep. and immigrants in our community. So we have Welcoming Week coming up in September, and it's the 10th through the 19th, and we have, gosh, 
quite a few events going on during that time. Um, one right here at the library mm -hmm. that we're really excited about on Wednesday, September fifteenth. It's an 15th. audio visual experience. It's, audio, it's our first. It's our first foray into um, any kind of storytelling. You know, stories we take very seriously, and um, you know, it's something that we wanted to make sure the time was right for, and it was something that was being asked for from the community that we serve. So, yeah. um, people were ready to start talking and telling their stories a little bit more publicly and um, they're just short little snippets three to five minutes of a of an extended interview um, paired with some beautiful f photographs up on the fourth floor of the library so so how many families have been integrated since soft landing began um a, about 400 individuals have come to missoula through the international rescue committee and kind of as you alluded to you know six years ago soft landing formed in 2015 um, to kind of hopefully bring resettlement back. Um, at the time, Missoula, Montana was one of two states in the nation not resettling refugees. Um, and so part of that, that, the piece of the puzzle for our city was that we would have to invite a resettlement agency to open an office here. And that became the International Rescue Committee. Right. I heard, um, and I heard about that um, because uh, the representative out of, it was like Salt Lake City, right? Yeah. And we didn't have like a good connection with that as much anymore and, and Soft Landing kind of became the uh, point of contact for Missoula to work with the IFC, I believe? IRC. IRC. Yeah, the International Sorry. Rescue Committee. Yeah, they're one of nine resettlement agencies. Um, they have like 26 offices across the U.S. Um, and there's only nine agencies that actually hold a contract with the State Department to right. do that kind of governmental side of the work. Um, yeah. So when the IRC agreed to come to Missoula, um, it's been awesome. They're celebrating their fifth anniversary right now. Um, and then we kind of, our community, kind of local grassroots effort, kind of reorganized and said, well, that piece is done, but we know that in communities that where refugees are, are highly successful and the integration goes really well and the community is able to um, really contribute, you see other nonprofit organizations engaging in that work. So at that point, we formed a, a nonprofit as well. And that's great. Um, to so, just to help. So some of the misconceptions as well, because you know, you know, nowadays people are just like, oh, not in my backyard, kind of attitudes and just a lot of things. I just want to, I mean, speak to that because there's always people out there just like, oh, why do they get to come here and all that stuff? So. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the beginning of our effort six years ago, there there were quite a few concerns and questions. Um, you know, but I think we just approached that with a really open door to say, yeah, yeah bring your questions, bring your concerns, let's talk about it. Um, we're all coming from different places with different life experiences, getting yeah. our news different places. You know, when I started this effort, I knew nothing about refugees. You know, like I really had to go out there and find out, find information, and it was hard to do. So, like, I, I'm not coming from a place where I expect everyone to, like, think the same way I do or know all these things about refugees and I think that um, you know that's a great space that soft landing can fill is just to be that open door that open ear to have the conversation about where people are coming from why they're coming here you know refugees are truly fleeing for fear of their life yeah. and their families lives um, and so understanding that you know they're coming here through a highly regulated process that um, you know they're it's the hardest way to get yeah. get here, and you know. But we also work with immigrants. We, you know, that are outside of that are not refugees, right? There's so many different quali qualifications of immigrants, yeah. and so. Um, Which brings me to my next question, because you guys do uh, regular testings, and you have like these classes and workshops for uh, folks coming in as well who want to uh, brush up on their um, residency and citizenship, right? Oh, so you know. Just, so refugees, when they come, they have a five-year path to citizenship. Right. Um, and so at five years, they're able to, to, to study for the exam and start to take the exams. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of in this really exciting space right now where it's been five years for the first families, oh, the first new yeah. families that got to Missoula. The Lifelong Learning Center, who's the adult education branch of right. Missoula Public yep. Schools, they are incredible. They are great. They're, they have a, so many classes, yeah. and they're great for even teaching computer literacy to people. Oh, yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. And so they work really closely. They hold the only free English language learning classes in Missoula. Wow. So they are the ones that kind of really work 
on the English spectrum with folks and then also they do the civics and citizenship preparation and that's always been a part of what they do. We have recently started some individual tutoring and some small classes to supplement what the Lifelong Learning Center does for the folks that are really on the verge of being ready to take the test. Um, but we work really closely in partnership with them. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's just a really exciting time. Um, and yeah, like five years, like you were saying, and you have so many experiences working with these families, having them integrated into the city of Missoula. Yeah. And how has that experience been for a lot of those families and yourself? Oh, I mean, for myself, it's been awesome, and it's been hard, and it's been life-changing. I mean, I was an arborist for the city before this, so I was a Montana girl <laughs> climbing trees with a chainsaw. So like, for me, life-altering. I'm for for the families that have come, it's it's a complete spectrum, right? Um, you can't you can't say one sentence and yeah. describe everything. Uh, a refugee who yeah. is a refugee or what is their experience here because um, a lot of times refugee the concept of it is is a have to leave their homeland yeah because if they could go back home a lot of them probably would want to if they could do that that's safely. home for them yeah yeah but coming as a refugee really is a commitment to being here because it, it really means you you can't return home um, for safety reasons so um, but yeah we have folks that get here and have you know, advanced education and yeah. speak great English, and in a month they're like starting to open their own business. I mean, we have food trucks going, we have all of these things. Um, and then you have families that have, you know, had the life experience where they've been stuck in refugee camps for decades, over yeah. 20 years, and those families need something a little bit different. And so it's really, um, it's. Yeah, and it's, the waiting is the hardest part for a lot of them too, because it's like everything's kind of up in the air. Are they going to move? the next day, or are they going to have to abruptly go to somewhere else, that kind of thing. Yeah, they a lot of their agency and choice gets taken from yeah. them. I mean, a place that can provide any kind of uh, vestige of sanctuary stability, it's nothing but beneficial to anybody going through some hard times as well. Yeah, Cause yeah. Because even and like talking in Missoula and talking about what's ha happening with the housing issues and that stuff like that, people buying up all these houses and stuff like that, like I just talk people and they anecdotally just be like, Californians, or that kind of thing, and, you know, just... Yeah, I mean, it, no home is going to be perfect, no. um, and, but I think Missoula has done a good job, a great job, of welcoming people. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you mentioned kind of the pushback that we got in the beginning. I mean, we don't really see that anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and Because really it's, it's the, the concept of the unknown. People are just like, yeah. oh, I don't know who's coming in. Oh, I don't know anything about that. And the more you get to know these people, which is honestly the best thing you can do, is yeah. you know when people move into town, they're, they're new people yeah. all the time. It's kind of what our exhibit is about on the 15th. It's just like, it's stories. Of, it's called Stories of Home. And it's, um, you know, it is talking about homes people are, came from and how Missoula fits into the picture of home for them and all that messy stuff in between, oh, yeah. you know. that we, we can never expect that a new home would replace a lifetime yeah. of experience. And, I, you know, people do miss a lot about where they where they grew up even if that was in a refugee camp even if we were to look at that and be like well they grew up in a camp with substandard conditions blah, 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 blah. but they still miss friends and family oh, and food and elements of home and there's still beauty to to that you know i think um we have a tendency to think that our life is the best way or that you know oh yeah you know so it's hopefully just brings a little bit of that to to our eyes as yeah. well and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, once again, there's a bunch of events that are upcoming as well. And like I looked on your guys' website, which is softlandingmissoula.org. It is softlandingmissoula.org. Yep. And uh, where can people find upcoming events and other uh, things that are happening? Yeah, right on the website. If you go under, oh my gosh, I should probably know this, but we'll, we'll have a banner for our welcoming week events. Um, they start on the 10th with a kickoff at Imagination Brewing. They're for the third year in a row brewing us a beer. Nice. Good old Missoula. And you also have some food as well. Ragif and Kamun and Kataif were are all food trucks operated by Iraqis who arrived here in Missoula as refugees. And they'll be at Imagination Brewing that night. And then Omar Kita, he is from... Um, West Africa and he'll be doing some some drumming and dancing Aww. for us so that'll be a really fun kickoff party and yeah then we have you know our United We Eat food program that we do year-round they're doing two different events we have a 
a launch party um, Sunday, the, that would be the 12th, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be at Masala doing taste testing yeah. of food and cookies and Eritrea and coffee. Um, and then there's also a virtual cooking class that United We Eat is putting on. We're wrapping up the whole thing with a soccer game. Oh, of yeah. Course. Yeah, I saw that. I was going to ask about that. Um, we can't do anything without food, music, and soccer. Like, that's the, the universal languages. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and there's some other events kind of mixed in there as well. So awesome. it should be a really fun way to... All of our events, will we will be practicing COVID precautions. Um, we will be very safe. A lot of them have, you know, completely outdoor um, opportunity to just be outside. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, just a lot of great opportunities to meet and greet, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, thanks yeah. for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, it's always fun to come visit you here in your beautiful new oh, space. Oh, so beautiful and, here. Yeah. Well, thanks, Scott. Yeah, of course. Have a good day. You too. <laughs> I just want to thank Mary Poole once again for joining us uh, this week to talk about Softline and all their events. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those events as we get later on in the show. So let's kick things off with some pre-critic. Kicking things off with the very first movie that's coming out this weekend. It is from the director of the Good Saw movie, which, yes, is an oxymoron, comes Malignant. We ain't talking about cancer. We're talking about that ghost cancer, where a ghost vengeful spirit attaches itself to a seemingly normal woman with a dark past. Um, things escalate as, you know, as a horror film, and you have to beat those demon ghost things before it's too late. But watch out for uh, tragedy is the forefront of these movies, and could not... Could we see a twist ending like we did in the Saw movies? Or like the ghost was a sci-fi thing and not a ghost after all? Is it kind of like the dead zone, but from the eyes of the killer who would see people dead but things get put into seventh gear as the killer notices her eye powers and possibly uses it against her uh this movie is kind of a, a remake of i think it's called fear itself anyways this up next one is a yes it is a heist movie so you <laughs> might want to pass on this one in jail you learn quite a few tricks and in this case the protagonist man is the card counter becomes his superpower. In the fantasy world of The House Never Wins comes the card counter starring the guy from Star Wars. You know, the, the Han Solo type who's not Han Solo. Anyways, he teams up with an even shadier young kids looking to use him to make money and learning that this guy was framed for a crime which he never committed in the first place, but he used the time in prison to become the card counter, blah, blah, blah. But there's always a high twist with these Vegas movies. Um, that movie, Casino, is the best representation of Vegas as it transitioned from gang control to more of a big business corporation. I suggest you watch that again better than this movie. Um, <laughs> this movie is kind of like, it's like kind of like a kingpin, like crime and all that stuff, but with women. But we have this one for the ladies. Uh, Queen Pin stars familiar comedy people as they stumble into con artistry and learn how to scam people using the power of coupons or coupons, if you're a middle-aged white woman, who copes with their empty nesting and with deals and steals from department stores. If you pay more than 39 cents for an undershirt, forget about dinner tonight. Also, tonight's TV dinner that is over three years old and you're not allowed to eat the new ones, Harold. Um, anyways, they almost got, uh, get caught or have the real bad guy get caught and then they have a vacation. All while scamming these poor coupon ladies and non-binary coupon blobs of human flesh. Well, I wouldn't watch these movies if they were the last movies on Earth. And speaking of last, Dub and Stuff is new with a uh, redub of 1964's The Last Man on Earth. Here it is. Oh. There we go. <laughs> Science, 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 science. Well, hello, scientist. How are you Greg, doing? Please come in. Um, how's that placebo for erectile dysfunction going? I think I accidentally made the real kind. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm, yes. I was working on heart medication, but it just turns out that the blood goes right to the penis. Hmm. No, oh, that's unfortunate. Well, what about male birth control? I heard we we're getting pretty close on that. Hmm, yes, of course. Hmm. When all other men are sterile, we will have all the ladies, us scientists. Hmm, I think I had a breakthrough. Really? You were just working on that for five seconds. I think you're a liar, and I'm leaving. Oh, 
Hello there, Dr. Hansen. How are you doing? Handsome. Yeah, Vincent Price just wandered in here. Understood. I'll take care of him. Hmm. Hmm. My name is Professor Hansom, and that name can be very misleading. Mr. Price. Uh, Mr. Hansen, very nice to see you again. Hmm, it's actually pronounced handsome. But I have a couple questions about, you know, why are you still here, and why are you trying to do science stuff? <laughs> this was my experiment from the very beginning, offering a science position to a non-scientist. Do you understand? Mm, oh, yes. Hmm, well then, can you just get out of here, please? Can't you see that I'm just trying to make a pill? On the same equivalent as men riding bikes for long distances? The practical applications are there, and it's totally possible. Short-sighted success is not good in the long term. You know that, right? Mm hmm Well, I guess you're right. But I'm getting really close to this. Uh, I'm tired of these excuses you make. You can't honestly believe you're a real scientist. Hmm, that's a very sophomoric theory that you've just made. I went to online university to get my PhDs. <laughs> you even know what a PhD stands for? Hmm? Well, of course I do. PhDs, these nuts. <laughs> oh, come on, that's not really funny. They already have male birth control, don't you know that? Well, they have a thing for everything these days, but not the greatest Ugh, things. I feel like talking to you. It's such a waste of time. It feels completely pointless. Well, then please leave. Like talking to a wall or something like that. I had my struggles too, you know. Well, not everyone can pass the MCATs like me. Ugh, you just don't know what it's like to be this handsome. They were just going to let me pass just by being handsome. But I studied hard, and I got the test, and I did the test. Hmm. Well, why don't you take a look? Man, I don't want to take a look at your petri dish. It's not. N it's nothing. It's not nothing. Ugh, you don't even sound why like Vincent. Trust me. Okay. Hmm. Ah, jeez. Come on. No, no, no. Keep looking. It's really interesting. You can, you'd like it. It's really cool. These are great Ugh, germs. You can't just grab a petri dish and just look at it and say it's science. Well, technically you can, but in this in instance, it's this is not science. This is just junk. Well, isn't science just junk you don't understand yet? Mm, I don't know about that. I hate actors. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about what the city council is up to with your admin and finance uh, committee meeting. Uh, this week uh, there was Labor Day, so the city council did not meet on Monday, but they are talking about a big change with how uh, the MRA is going to move forward on their policy about deviating funds and tax incre increment financing. But let's talk a little bit more about housing. So uh, one of the things that are happening as well is that there's a big review uh, fund uh, for, uh, so a big review for funds going to home and the Community Development Block Grant, otherwise known as CDBG. The plan outlines the goals and outcomes for projects funded by the program in year 2020. Entitlement fund allocated for the home and CDBG projects. And this has a lot to do with a lot of those COVID monies going towards communities, building infrastructures, and affordable housing. So here's Karen uh, Garen, uh, Gazavoda. Uh, she uh, kind of kicks things off with the presentation. This is what she had to say. These funds help benefit individuals with low and moderate income and leverage resources to improve the supply of affordable housing, public improvements, and public services. Low and moderate income residents are classified as those whose income does not exceed 80% of the area median income, which in Missoula for a family of four is around $75,000. The caper. All right, so um, let's see here. I have to go back to my notes. There's a lot, uh, there's not much luck for those single income households since many wages restrict access to affordable housing and sustained housing for those going into debt from schooling and being, uh, and being, uh, and going over their AMI. Uh, you get paid more, uh, but debt for most is not a contributing factor in these cases in, ter ter in terms of, uh, local area median income. So if you're making a good amount of money, but then you're also in debt, you have to have those monthly payments and then bills compile over time. It doesn't actually address a lot of those things. And that's one of my critiques of this particular thing uh, in terms of uh, maria, uh, medium income. And I'm assuming they probably have some kind of deals with people who are in, in, in debt so they can help with them as long as that. But one of the biggest takeaways pr from this presentation are their goals. And this is a uh, part of it. Here is Karen once again. The CAFER is our chance to tell the story of what we accomplished using our federal dollars over the past year, we report our accomplishments in a connection not only to our annual goals as outlined in our annual action plan, but also in relation to the larger goals we set in the consolidated plan, which is published every five years. 
All right, so as you can see here, they have their uh, their goals all set up around here with, you know, rental first and foremost, then home ownership, then uh, homelessness, and then with the planning administration. It kind of seems like planning administration should definitely be first in, in terms of like tackling and understanding the, some of the needs that need to be assessed in the community. But that's here nor there. They seem to have an idea exactly how they're going to move forward on this. This topic is an, an end all be all for ha the housing crisis. This is just uh, one of the little pieces to the puzzle as they're trying to curve the uh, increased demand for people moving into the city of Missoula, but also helping the people in Missoula sustain housing throughout this pandemic and also uh, post pandemic as well. So uh, let's see. So in 2020, the 2020 money in these affordable housing programs reached an average to about 100 to 200 thousand dollars per grant, which accumulated to about uh, roughly 400. 93 to about $719,000 to many different of the projects, which they're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, Trivi uh, the Trinity Navigation Project, which is a huge deal within the uh, community of Missoula as well. So this is just kind of like we're going to the presentation of some of the accomplishments, these monies, and this uh, section is talking about in retrospect. In 2020, we funded two home projects, the Trinity Apartments partially funded in program year 20 is a collaboration among nonprofit developers, a private developer and supportive service providers. Our ultimate goal is the construction of 202 homes people can afford on two separate sites. Trinity broke ground in the spring of 2021 and is expected to be completed in 2023. All right, so let's go on to m most of my notes. The Trivity Navigation Center is a one-stop shop for provided homes and also navigation for ho housing folks as well. And it's supposed to cover about 30 to 70 percent of the uh, the area uh, local area median income. Uh, so the whole idea is like you know. Um, if you make X amount of money, maybe you make like twenty to like thirty thousand dollars a year on your uh, on your job as well. So you would fall under the purview of the thirty to seventy percent of annual income. But it's also uh, cumulative. So a lot of times, you have if you have two people who have jobs, it it can kind of be difficult for a lot of to be able to get into the to get into this Trinity Trinity Navigation Center because it's geared for more affordable house affordable housing and uh, and not for it's kind of it's it's interesting because there's affordable housing there's a so certain certain restrictions but there's a lot of things if you really think about it that need to be addressed in terms of just like like it, I'm just going on this rant about just like debt and just like potential bills and all sorts of other payments that you have to also take into account because this is basically based on how much you make and how much you are allocating from what you make to this fund, disregarding all other uh, debt and all stuff like that. So that's just something that uh, that just kind of like is just really bothering me a part uh, about like certain affordable housing. But anyways, uh, part of this fund and part of the grants that they got from this, it also improved and also helped build the Metal Arc building, which houses YWCA, uh, 31 uh, uh, units. And also they have like 16 different family areas for uh, people struggling with houselessness, uh, particularly for women and families, uh, which was completed this year and funded through these grants, along with additional funds for homeless shelters, the Pavarella Center, and they want to have a, 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 a have additional staffing and have navigation folks as well to help uh, navigate people into housing. That's kind of like one of the things is they want to have more people on the with boots on the ground to help navigate people to get uh, into homes and more permanent housing. Also, the uh, reactive funds needed to help those uh, they had uh, to deny because of COVID restrictions and services who contracted the disease, like in the Sleepy Inn Motel for those who cannot quarantine. And so that kind of goes back into uh, what... Uh, what the POV had to do, which basically had to have their attendance, and then they had to open a, a bunch of temporary other shelters. The uh, the Salvation Army was a, a place for folks to go to, and also the uh, the Johnson and North Street, uh, the former Sheck Firehouse, and which was their uh, their kind of a s a fillover space for a lot of the homeless folks in Missoula. But then, of course, they're trying to encourage people. I don't want to get into it too much, but. Uh, this last thing I wanted to mention is the temporary safe, safe outdoor space, which wasn't as much to provide more space for people, but to encourage people from the reserve street encampment to move over there. Anyways, let's move on. Let's talk about the thing that is probably one of the most controversial and most important things within the city of Missoula as we are moving forward in developing and growing as a city of Missoula. That is called MRA, otherwise known as the Missoula Redevelopment Agency, to put a new policy for their... Uh, 
agency. This organization is known in Missoula as the one who works with getting TIF funds for developers. Gwen Joan talks about this, and she really likes the TIF and how we've been able to use it in the city of Missoula, and so she's been uh, a big advocate for this. So if you have any issues, Gwen Jones is probably the perfect person to talk to in terms of the benefits of TIFs. Frankly, this is something that several of us counselors have been working on for years now, which is kind of the way it rolls out sometimes on city council. And to give you an idea of how long, John Debari spent a lot of time on this. Um, we talked to a lot of people in town, did a lot of research, and there have been a lot of discussions in the community for the last few years on the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and tax increment financing. So we thought it uh, was prudent to take a look at this. And frankly, the fact that it has taken years is very valuable in that during that time period, we could see projects come to fruition. We could also see changes in our local economy on a gradual scale, as well as on a heightened scale with the pandemic. And it helps to create a context there um, because we really wanted to approach this carefully and get it right. We wanted to do was oh, to create. Okay, so that was the first part of that. And uh, this is an update to their policy in terms of how they move forward with MRA and financing and tax increment financing as well. And uh, TIF for short, and should or shouldn't be used to leverage development in the area. So, so uh, basically all, uh, all states in the United States use what is an iteration of TIF, except for the state of Arizona. Uh, they talked a little bit more about uh, what they're gonna do to approach M MRA's future. And uh, this is what Gwen Jones had to say about how uh, the city wants to continue using TIFs. What we wanted to do was to create certainty I think our main focus was to create certainty for taxing jurisdictions and taxpayers while balancing that certainty with preserving revenue for the development that Missoula needs, um, but frankly, that we have extremely limited tools for and high, high in that category, I would put affordable housing. So it's really a balancing of those different values that we wanted to bring into a little sharper focus with this resolution. All right. So. Uh Let's, because there's a lot of uh, city council members and Gwen Jones thinks these tools outlined in policies that are good for the community and creating a better impact to development. So in, in many respects, this is the positive outlook on this is to encourage developers to come to Missoula and develop and then also uh, redevelop some of their development to include sidewalks, lighting things, um, just like mitigating blight and overall infrastructure improvements in the particular area that they're developing. So in many ways, they can give a tax break because of that, because it overall would improve the city of Missoula. But the argument on the other side is that the uh, the taxes and the money that would have gone towards uh, taxing the developer would be onto the, uh, the, the future owners, or because a lot of times developers put their money there, they build the building, and then they end up selling it to uh, another organization that kind of runs the the deal because the developers just develop the building and then they just go on to the next development because that's their job and uh, that's just on and that just seems to be the issue is that we're in 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 the more w from what I've seen in terms of people commenting and uh, some of the uh, deal with this is that it it's the concept of the future taxes on the site so if a, when the people move in there they're paying for more of the infrastructure, the improvements that they have been done in the particular area. But on the other side, um, one can argue that the city of Missoula is kind of uh, leveraging and paying developers to develop here. So that can kind of be interesting. But Jordan has also praises the new policy in terms of helping streamline development in the city of Missoula. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that this formalizes um, the notion of life cycle planning. Um, and this is something that MRA has done um, but um, just as a, as a 30 year old um, would make different choices in a, in a retirement plan um, than, a, than a 60 year old nearing retirement might make, um, URDs need to make different choices over the life of the URD. Um, there's different investment strategies that make sense based, based on community need and based on um, the function of tax increment financing. Um, so um, uh, URDs really need to build increment in the early days. Um, and, and that is a necessary step in order to um, really invest in the community priorities like housing and child care and um, transportation infrastructure. Um, and um, so I, I think the resolution um, as, as will be uh, presented um, really codifies this. All right, so uh, th this is all a lot of the city council member 
praising tax increment financing in the M MRA for a lot of the stuff they've done in the future, even before the presentation even started. And a lot of the city council members like how the MRA is doing and trying to improve the process and policy. Dale Bickle, Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Missoula, talks more about the details in just terms of uh, th uh, showing off a graph. So this is a long quote. So uh, this is what Dale Bickle had to say, and uh, this is also on the MRA's website. So here it is. This is a, a slide that's from um, MRA's website uh, that talks about how how the life of a of an urban renewal district works, and you know, typically in a and how this works, there is a time frame where there where it's identified that there is an area in the city that needs redevelopment. I mean, you know, it could be that um, it's, it's a stagnant or declining tax base. Um, a tax income in district is adopted, and the powerful incentives within that district create private investment, and and. And as the um, and as the TIF ages and private investment starts, you can see the incremental portion. So that portion of of that where the TIF was frozen, that's available for uh, infrastructure development inside that district. And so early on in the life of a of a district, um, uh, we're, we're starting to create increment because there is private sector investment. Um, typically, those uh, those in the the MRA. Um, makes investments um, in partnership with the private sector to build infrastructure supporting those investments, but that builds that that tax increment tax base. And these investments start to happen, and over time, as those in, as those developments come online, it, it improves the tax base. And then, it, as a tax increment district matures, there is additional tax base uh, available where we are able to um, to, to uh, specifically address a, a more public infrastructure issues. Um, and, and use those dollars to, to fund that, um, those type of things. All right, so if you take a good look at this map, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of words. There's definitely a lot of stuff as well, but um, the, the level of investment moving forward on this also helps encourage more developers into coming down here. And development, even speaking frankly, is that they put a risk by building here. It's like they're gonna build a whole new building in a spot in the city of Missoula and they don't know if it's going to work or not. And part of this is uh, the TIF funding to help mitigate like first and foremost, TIF has always been used um, the, th to the bare basic is to mitigate blight. So you build a building in a spot of your downtown and you're just like, I don't think that really building really matches the aesthetic of my community. If I give you a tax break where you make it look a little bit more towards the uh, culture uh, or the uh, community as well and so that's what the original process was but Missoula's has kind of really just made it really malleable and flexible and how they want to move forward with the TIF funding with improving infrastructure like sidewalks and uh, water main replacements electricity put it underground and all that stuff anyways uh, let's see here and of course, let's let's also refer just a little bit of history is the Merck Hotel. Merck Hotel is a prime example of the city of Missoula using TIF funding. A lot of controversy behind that, including, you know, uh, why do we have to tear down this building? But uh, one of the things that the, the what was done was the preservation, like, of the, I think it was the pharmacy section of the mercantile building. I'm pretty sure it is. But later down the line, they requested more TIF funding for a, a different hotel in which they didn't... Uh, have any kind of infrastructure improvements or any kind of other deal with that and so MRA denied them. So it, w it, it isn't just like they're printing money for developers just to develop. They want to figure out how their TIF funding or their tax increment financing would improve the uh, community as a whole. So there's just a lot of that going on there as well. And so Dale also talks about uh, where the buck stops, uh, where, you know, it's like, oh, like w at one point do we have to be like, okay, cool your jets developers and this is what he had to say. Right now, uh, the um, the um, resolution proposes a nine percent uh, limitation on total taxable value of increment districts. Um, in the next presentation, you'll see Ellen and I will talk about how that cap specifically works on the ground and kind of looking forward to the known projects that we are working on, such as the Scott Street uh, housing project and how that uh, how that might impact how a cap might impact those type of things, so we can make a, a really informed decision uh, about this. Um, I think one thing that's important to note, we work with our bond council on, uh, 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 on proposing the language related to uh, the cap. Um, and it's that, that the cap is subordinate to our, uh, our, our, our debt covenant. So uh, lots of uh, MRI projects are, are bonded. Um, and, um, and so and there, there's a contractual agreement to, to maintain certain financial covenants and this cap um, is subordinate to those. 
Um, so we can't uh, we, we can't violate our covenants by with this cap. All right. So you know that's you know nine percent cap. It, you know. It, it's uh yeah it's pretty good, um but Dale Bickle goes really deep into the last two years of TIF funding and how they raised the percentage of taxable value from 5.9 percent in 2018 and to a projection of about 8.7 by 2022. Um, TIFs uh, have a very narrow area that covers uh, that is covered and the city has their urban renewal districts which covers parts of downtown both TIFs. It covers the project and the area in place making it easier to avoid certain taxes from one to another. So Dale talks about uh, urban renewal districts and you know that's something that was used in the past to uh, you know like mitigate blight and kind of do this kind of things to uh, improve our downtown corridor and our downtown Missoula area. And so here is some of the uh, district values um, in terms of our current ur ur urban renewal districts. Um, and then just as a bit of context, this is the snapshot of this year, um, basically what where the taxable value uh, relies. So you can see URD3 um, as, uh, as a large mature district has, has quite a bit of, um, of incremental value in it um, versus the, the other districts there. Yep. So yeah, as you can clearly see, you know that that this is like how much each of these uh, uh, taxable urban renewal districts are. Uh, a lot of times they uh, they put these in to uh, determine like how much money they can get from this and see how they can accumulate funds to help improve the areas, do some projects, maintenance, and just some typical things that uh, the city uh, needs to uh, keep up on. Um, but also uh, open it up for uh, potential future development and also help leverage uh, future development in the moving forward. All right, so uh, there's a lot more information in this meeting. I kind of gave you the uh, summary, just kind of go in a glossy overview of it, but feel free to go on to the city's website, uh, ci.missoula.mt.us. Um, they're going to be talking about the MRA's policy officially uh, in uh, September 20th, so that's when it's going to be presented to the city council meeting, but they're going to also meet up on the administration a admin and finance uh, committee meeting next Wednesday. Um, they haven't, n I don't think they've determined the times because they usually do that on Mondays, but for uh, further regulation, ci.missoula.mt.us is as easy as it's going on here. You can go to click on under the meetings. Yo, I want to look at a city council meeting. There, just click on what it says meetings. And then you go down here. I suggest the calendar view because the list view can kind of be confusing because with the calendar view, you can go back in time. You can see many of the archived uh, uh, city council meetings in here as well. But this is a wonderful s tool and website for people to get a, um, um, educated about your local government. So I have a video for you guys up next, and it is a nice uh, a retrospect of our summer camps. And as we're transitioning into our uh, Saturday drop-ins, which is every Saturday at 1 p.m. for kids age about... 8 to 14, so if you have a kid uh, that is interested in stop animation or typical media, uh, they can get come on down here. It is free. So without further ado, here is a taste of what some of the kids have made this last year. Give me some water now. Hey, you give me that car now. Get back here. Yo, my I car, my car. brand new car. I just got it and it destroyed. Stop down on the floor, everybody do the dinosaur. Come man. Ugh, why did you ever say that? Oh, hey, 
Hey, hey, that's a cute pig. What? <laughs> Captain's log. log. Piggy, Piggy McOink Oink Oink. Stardate two. two. It's going to be going a long, long journey, journey back, back to back Earth, Earth, but, but, but I, think I think I'll get, I'll there, get there eventually. eventually. Hey guys, welcome back. That was, uh, yeah, just a little taste of some of the Saturdays. It's a little rough. But let's move on to, uh, yeah, all your uh, events that are happening this weekend as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of uh, those events with Soft Landing, but we're kicking things off with your events here at the Missoula Public Library. Tiny Tales and Storytime starts at 10.30 a.m. It's for kids of uh, a toddler to young reading ages to encourage kids to get with books, but also encourage um, some playtime and some stories and uh, um, just enjoying reading all together. Um, then also, if you're a more crafty and you want to be creative, Yarns and Watercolor here at the library at 12 noon at the library. You can stitch and uh, chat with other people as well, mm, you know what I was going to say. And also some ra Watercolor with Rob P. over at noon at the library. You can ask uh, where these are, and they usually host them in the uh, third floor meeting room, and there's also another place here in, in the library as well. Um, they're doing a hiring carnival, so this is a big deal because uh, employees are desperate to get more employers, employees, employers, employees. Anyways, it's a hiring carnival. You can uh, assess and you can uh, determine which job is going to pay more, and hi th this is a this is an employee market we're living in right now. We're also living in a landlord market, so that's bad. But this is a great opportunity at Walmart starting at 3 this afternoon. Career opportunities as well as having food, games, and prizes. Great way to leverage your hourly wage and compare it with many businesses. It will be at the Mullen Road location, Walmart. Starting at 3. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a pretty cool. But anyways, Archetypes and Oracle Group Show Gallery Opening by Hand Collective Gallery. This is a... Uh, Archetypes and Oracles is a group show of uh, select oracles, cards, and handmade decks incorporated. Archetypes and autobiographies. They gotta say, like, okay, there's too many words of archetypes in here, so let's just, I'm just gonna skip those words. Local and out of town artists include Kim Grissom, uh, Erica Hickley, uh, Shelley Riesig, uh, Jen uh, Bardsley, uh, Jillian Kessler, and so many other artists are gonna be there from September 10th for 5 to 7 p.m. The viewings and appointments. Uh, throughout the month, uh, text. Oh, geez, there's a, there's a lot going on there, but as well, this is a thing that starts at 5 p.m. tonight, and it's at the By Hand Collective Gallery. Um, Soft Landing is doing their kickoff party. If you've already heard, which is the Welcoming Week kickoff, uh, join Soft Landing for food, music, and great beer for the fourth year in a row. The ca uh, the country's first combo microbrewery transformation center, Imagination Brewing Company, will be creating custom beer to uh, commemorate the kickoff event. While you enjoy your brew, a uh, commune er uh, er Arabian cuisine and Rajig food trucks will have serving the best Middle Eastern food around. Top off this week with OS African drum and dance, and you've got a party. Uh, this is at Imagination Brewing Company at 5.30 p.m. tonight. And after that, maybe you can wander on down to the baseball game or just listen to them from a distance. Missoula is going against Billings starting at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Live music with Josh Farmer is going to be at 7 p.m. at the Cranky Sam Public House. Live music by Jim Driscoll. Jazz Trio will be at the Stave and Hoop Speak Easy. Um, Saturday, uh, so Saturday, we're going to have a bunch of those markets and stuff. I'm just looking at my time. Uh, so if you're interested in the far farmer's markets, the River City Market is at by the Carousel. you got the People's Market, which is off Pine Street. you got the OG uh, Farmer's Market, which is by the Red X's at the end of Higgins Avenue. Uh, and then we got some McCrame and uh, Ms. Mimosa's Rainbow Keychain Workshop at the Create Art Bar starting at 10 a.m. on Saturday. You can join Lexi from Ela and Company and learn how to make your own... Uh, McCrane Rainbow Keychain. You will have uh, several colors to choose from and mimosas. And this is from 10 to 11 a.m. And at 11 a.m., right after that, maybe you can uh, go on down to uh, Missoula's Homestead, the Moon Randolph Homestead. Bring your friends and family to the Moon, Rando Moon Randolph's Homestead's Open Days, which will run every Saturday, May through October from 11 to 5 p.m. Get a tour um, get a tour from the people themselves or take your own tour as well as they are moving closer and closer to their cider days where they'll be able to pick uh, apples for the homestead as well. Um, some more music happening on Saturday night. Tom Catmull will be playing at Draftworkers Brewing 
Company at 5 p.m. at DraftWorks. Live music with John Dango at Cranky Sam Public House at 7 p.m. on Saturday. And also DJ Auntie E. It's going to be at the Union Club at 9 p.m. on Saturday. And then Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. at the Badlander. But I also wanted to mention that they're doing a rain barrel workshop on Sunday. So if you're interested in getting up early Sunday morning after a late night of DJing and up, join the National Wildlife Federation and Mud in creating your own rain barrel from recycled syrup drums. While the workshop, you'll learn about your local watershed and how your rain barrel will help keep our waters clean. And this is a free sign up and with a $30 value. Uh, Oh, so for so for so actually, this does cost money. Forget everything I just said. You'll also have an opportunity to uh, certify your backyard at the event. Join the Missoula Community Wildlife Habitat and receive a free sign, which is a thirty-dollar value. But this whole event itself is going to be at forty dollars for uh, mud members and fifty-five dollars for uh, non-members, and you get to do a, a rain barrel workshop and you get to learn some cool things. And also, there's a farmers market Target Range every Sunday at ten a.m. and this will be going on until October. Uh, let's see. UWE Wholesale Lunch Cookies and uh, Etrian Coffee. Uh, Masala's is doing a uh, thing with Soft Landing on Sunday at 12 noon. Um, Soft Landing and United We Eat. Extravaganza come celebrate the launch of uh, UWE's line of chef-made grab-and-go products, which will be on sale at Masala's this fall. Um, the Artsy Amit featuring Amit Pilid Cello. So uh, just so you know, the Missoula Symphony Orchestra will be playing uh, Sunday night at 7.30 p.m., which will be featuring the artist Amit Pilid. Um, I'm totally sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, this composition is intended to symbolize a view of our planet from outer space and offers a new global perspective on the joys and sorrows of humanity. So it's about $30 for any uh, regular folks, and then $25 for seniors and $10 for a student if you are a student. So those are all the events that are happening this weekend as well. I just wanted to uh, mention as well as that MCAT will be doing their uh, Saturday drop-ins at 1 p.m. on Saturday, and this is encouraged for kids. Um, hell, we can even, oh, <laughs> sorry, but we can even invite parents to come on down. It can be a great uh, family activity for you and kids. But just so you guys know, there is limited space. We have a limitation of up to six kids. We might give some room for up to eight as long as the kids work together but if they're just going to work by their lonesomes um, then we will only be able to do up to six kids per week during this pandemic and also just the resources and the space that we have in the new public library all right so without further ado i want to thank you guys for joining me i will be back next friday to talk a little bit more about this and that but for the most part um i want to thank you guys for joining me and for wake up missoula i'm scott ramph